In this lesson, we are going to look at geologic contacts, unconformities and faults, so stick around. Now in this lesson, we're going to take a look at several structures called geologic contacts, which can be broken down into three distinct categories. They are depositional contacts, intrusive contacts, and faults. Now in this video, I'm going to break depositional contacts into two groups, conformable and unconformable contacts. But first, a definition. A contact in the geologic record is simply a boundary where one rock body is separated from another. But different kinds of processes are responsible for the four different kinds of contacts that I just mentioned. Let's look at conformable contacts first. Conformable contacts are usually produced when sediment is deposited over other sedimentary layers in a semi-continuous fashion. So in this example, the lower sand layer was deposited first, and then at some stage later, another sand layer was deposited over the first. Now, we say that this contact is conformable because the two parallel layers were probably deposited in a similar depositional environment with one layer deposited soon after the other. In other words, not much time, at least from a geologic perspective, passed between the deposition of these two layers. Now, that brings us then to unconformable contacts. Unconformable contacts are usually produced by periods of non-deposition or erosion, and unlike conformable contacts, are thought to contain gaps in geologic time that span millions to sometimes hundreds of millions of years using the conventional dating scheme. Now, there are four major kinds of unconformable contacts. They are disconformities, angular unconformities, non-conformities, and paraconformities. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Now, disconformities are found between parallel layers of sedimentary rocks and they represent a surface of non-deposition or erosion lasting millions to hundreds of millions of years, but which was finally buried over during a later period of deposition. Now, here for example, we are told that five million years is to be found within this disconformity, and we'll talk about this example later at the end of the video. Non-conformities are erosional surfaces and they're found between older plutonic or metamorphic rocks at the bottom and younger sedimentary rocks at the top. Now, once again, significant amounts of geologic time are thought to have passed between the erosion and the subsequent deposition of sedimentary rocks. Now, the Great Unconformity in the Grand Canyon is the most well-known non-conformity in the world with nearly two billion years of time supposedly passing between these two rock bodies at this location. Angular unconformities, well, they're perhaps some of the most sort of identifiable of all the unconformities, given the striking contrast between the two rock types. Now, again, here, the two rock types have a sedimentary origin, but the bottom suite of rocks are tilted and beveled flat. That signifies that there was a prior period of tectonic uplift, followed by erosion and then deposition. Okay, so that brings us to paraconformities. Now, for all intents and purposes, paraconformities look a lot like the conformable sedimentary contacts we described first. And that's because the contact is incredibly flat with no discernible sign of erosion or non-deposition. Paraconformities are unconformities, however, because Millions to tens of millions of years are said to have passed at the contact. Young age creationists have often used paraconformities to argue against the passage of deep time, as these contacts, especially when these paraconformities are found in ancient near shore or terrigenous environments, well, they must have experienced quite a few episodes of erosion and deposition. All right, well, that brings us to the category of contacts produced by magmatic intrusions. Now, in this kind of contact, hot magma works its way into the surrounding sedimentary rock, which colloquially is called 
country rock. Now, common examples would be plutons, sills, and igneous dikes. Both the crystallizing magma and the surrounding country rock respond differently to the magmatic intrusion. Chill zones, they appear in the rapidly crystallizing igneous rock because the country rock is very cool relative to the hot magma, and this causes the crystal size at the margins of the intrusion to be much smaller than the crystal size in the center. The country rock, on the other hand, gets so hot at its margins, that it sometimes bakes, and this process called contact metamorphism often produces different types of metamorphic rocks, such as marble and quartzite. Now, finally, there are fault contacts. Faults, well, they're simply breaks or fractures between two rock bodies where some parallel movement occurs between the two rock surfaces. Now, if no movement occurs, we just call it a joint. Now, there are three main kinds of faults. They are dip slip, strike slip, and oblique slip. Now, a fault plane represents the surface of the fault itself. The two blocks separated by the fault plane, they have their own names. So this block is called the fault wall, and this block is called the hanging wall. Now, this terminology comes from 19th century miners who literally dug tunnels into the fault in search of precious metals. Now, since the floor of the tunnel was cut into this block, well, they called it the fault wall, and the hanging wall gets its name because, well, that's where they hung their lanterns. Okay, let's take a look at the different kinds of dip-slip faults first. The name dip-slip, well, it comes from the direction of slippage. The dip of the block represents the angle that the fault plane makes with the horizontal. If the hanging wall moves down the dip surface relative to the fault wall, then we call this a normal fault. If the hanging wall moves up the dip surface relative to the fault wall, then we call this a reverse fault. It's that easy. Strike slip faults get their name because movement of either the fault wall or the hanging wall is not vertical, but occurs parallel to strike in a horizontal fashion. The San Andreas Fault is perhaps the most well-known strike slip fault in the world. Now, defining the direction of that movement in strike slip faults, it depends on the movement of the ground as will be seen by an observer on the opposite side of the fault. So in this example, you can see that the ground on the other side of the observer has moved to the left. So this would be called a left lateral strike slip fault. Now notice that if the observer was on the other side of the fault, it would still be called a left lateral strike slip fault. Oblique slip faults result when the slip direction is both vertical and horizontal. Okay, it's time now to test your comprehension. So I'm going to ask a series of questions followed by the answers. So if you don't want to hear the answers right away, then be sure to place the video on pause. Okay, here's the first question. Which one of these descriptions best fits the term geologic contact? And the answer is a distinct boundary where one rock body is separated from another. All right, what kind of unconformity is this? And if you said a disconformity, great job. All right, what kind of fault is this? And if you said a reverse fault, then you would be correct. What's the name of this block? And fault wall is what you're looking for here. Okay, what do we call this rock that surrounds a magma body? And yes, country rock is the answer you're looking for here. All right, which one of these unconformities generally shows no sign of non-deposition or erosion? And the answer is a paraconformity. Now, if you got all those correct, then give yourself a pat on the back. Great job. Okay, it's time now for our spotlight on creationism. The hermit formation in the Grand Canyon area, it's been interpreted as a vast floodplain replete with complex systems of streams and rivers that supposedly existed about 280 million years ago using the conventional time scale. Now the Coconino sandstone that sits on top of the Hermit Formation has been interpreted as an equally vast desert that buried the Hermit floodplains as the climate became more arid 
about 275 million years ago. And that leaves a gap, sort of about 5 million years, that separated the end of the floodplain system and the start of the desert system. Now, what's interesting from a creationist perspective, however, is that the unconformity that exists between the Hermit Formation and the Coquineano Sandstone shows virtually no evidence of this supposed 5 million years. And that's because there is no to little evidence of erosion in the form of dips, gullies, or ancient stream beds. Now, that's a fact that becomes quite salient when looking at the contact. It is almost dead flat. Well, what about 5 million years of non-deposition instead? Well, there's no help there either, since there are no known soil weathering profiles, nor are pebbles or lithified hermit silstone found at the base of the Coconino. And it's for this reason that this particular unconformity could well be called a paraconformity. There simply is no or little evidence supporting the existence of these supposed 5 million years. In fact, before the early 1980s, most geologists thought that the two formations were somewhat conformable. That is, there was a sort of a semi-continuous deposition that occurred across the boundary. But that all changed in the late 1970s when geologists first discovered the Schnibbly Hill Formation in nearby Sedona, and that separated the Hermit Formation from the Coconino Sandstone. This new formation, which was supposedly deposited over a 5 million year period meant that five million years must now be inserted between the Hermit Formation and the Coconino Sandstone, even though no evidence for this five million years exists at the contact. And it's not just this one unconformity. Throughout the Grand Canyon formations, no less than 10 unconformities are said to exist that collectively amount to the passage of more than 250 million years. Yet, in each case, these unconformities tell a surprisingly similar story. Each of the contacts are very flat, with little evidence of passage of those 250 million years. Now, yes, a few gullies and some deep stream beds, some as deep as 60 meters or 180 feet, have been discovered at a few locations. But the rarity of such features is surely telling. And if those 250 million years really existed, then deep gullies and stream beds should be the rule, not the exception. Now, as a catastrophist, I think one of the most promising research projects will be to focus on sheet flow mechanisms working over relatively short periods of time. And what that means is, rather than these sediments being deposited in channels, they were laid down rapidly, more like sedimentary blankets. Now, these same kinds of flow conditions could also account for sheet-like erosion. Now, yes, channeling was still at work, we still see that, but it took on more of an auxiliary role with sheet flow taking the front seat. Now, from a creationist perspective, the energy required to produce catastrophic sheet flow conditions such as this, well, it could have come from greater rates of plate tectonic movement in the past. And importantly, these processes didn't have to take place during Noah's flood, if that's what you're thinking. Uh, they could have, and many of my colleagues have good reason for thinking that they did, but it's also possible that many of the formations in the Grand Canyon were deposited before Noah's flood. Now, in my model, I propose that some of the early Paleozoic formations were probably deposited during the 1600 years before Noah's flood, but increased in intensity, culminating in the onset of the flood proper, as it is described in Genesis 6 through 9. And I've put a link in the description for part one of a three-part series that I actually did on this, if you are interested. Okay, so that's all from me, Creation Geology for Beginners with Ken Colson. Please, if you thought this was interesting in any way and helpful, pound the like button, subscribe, and share this video on your social media platform right now. Of course, there's a link in the description if you'd like to give, I always appreciate that. And uh, we will see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.